You know, and I always like about that race is if you run the film forward or backward, I win. <laughs> Uh, so the 300 seconds between myself and Yveni off the uh, Russian athlete, just a breath. And Yveni was the heavy favorite in the race. He was the number one ranked half mile in the world for two years prior to the Olympic Games. I think he made one mistake, though. He didn't wear a golf cap. That probably was the margin of uh, victory. The hat, by the way, in fact, one of the runners was asking me uh, where the hat was. It's in the National Track and Field Hall of Fame in the Armory in New York City. But what I always find interesting is that they put the hat into the Hall of Fame three years before they wanted to put me in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> but three hundredths of a second, as you imagine, is just it's just very, very close. You know, runners runners will know, Ben will know, when you cross that finish line, you have that peripheral vision, and you can kind of sense if you've won. Well, the Russian had fallen right over the finish line, so I thought I'd won, raised my arms up, but three hundredths of a second, and cumulatively, you can't tell the difference. So they had to look at the photo finish of the race, which took about five minutes. We're just standing around at the end of the track looking at each other. But the way you found out who won in Munich was rather neat because there were two gigantic pitch black scoreboards at each end of the Olympic Stadium. So the first name that flashed up on the scoreboard is going to be the winner. So the whole world found out that you found out who won. So when Waddle D USA with my time flashed up, you, know, you can feel the rush of adrenaline. They, get you to, they allow you to take that uh, victory lap. Well, I was very fortunate prior to the Montreal Games in 76 to do a commercial for Burger King. Their theme back then was Have It Your Way with Burger King. It's still their theme uh, today. And in the commercial, they wanted to try to recreate that Olympic race. So to make it look as realistic as possible, they got two African-American athletes that were going to be the two Kenyan runners coming down the home stretch. They weren't just two run of the mill athletes, so there are a couple of top-flight U.S. sprinters. In fact, one of them is John Carlos, who got silver medal in the Mexico games in the 200 meters. So you gotta kinda picture the first take of this commercial. We're standing at the end of the UCLA track. The director yells, action. And these guys start out like they're in the finals of the Olympic games. And I'm sprinting down the home stretch as fast as I can. They beat me by 20 yards. They're way, way and it's just as you'd imagine in a Hollywood production, the director comes storming out of the stands. Cut, cut, the white kid's gotta win this race. <laughs> So these guys beat me again the second time. The director's really starting to get ticked, so I went to the track and said, okay, great idea. Have them run about three quarters of a lap. They'll get all tired and sweaty looking. I'll jump in with 100 yards to go. I'll be able to handle them well. The director goes, great idea, Dave. Take 17 takes to get this thing right. <laughs> so they ran three miles worth of quarters, and they've never spoken to me since, but I, <laughs> but I loved it. Now, I've been uh, very fortunate to return to Munich several times over the last uh, 40 years. And every time I would go back, as you'd imagine, and bring back a flood of memories to stroll through the Marion plots in downtown Munich, where the athletes had the tendency to congregate back in 72, uh, to see the Olympic village where the Arab-Israeli incident unfolded that you're all familiar with in, in Munich. And for me to go back and visit that Olympic stadium, especially to walk down on that straightaway that was so important in my life, uh, now minus the 80,000 screaming fans, and think again the thoughts I had in, as an athlete uh, over 40 years ago. For a single moment, their finish line, the race was over, yet the spirit of that moment has never left me. You know, it still uh, amazes me to think how important one minute, 45 and 9 cents seconds was in my life. It's just a fleeting moment in time, yet it's the culmination of a lot of years of hard work and, and perseverance. And it's really affected every day of my life since I was talking to a group uh, at Rhodes College about 15 years ago, probably around 96 or so. And I said something I don't think I'd ever said up to that point. I don't think a single day has gone by since Munich where at some point during the day, I don't think, even if it's just for a flash, I don't think of that Olympic moment. It's really that important to an Olympian. It's that important to the, to the athletes who competed in the London Games uh, this year. Well, it's a pleasure for me to be here, and I really appreciate, Arch, the invitation to come and, and talk with uh, all of you. As Jennifer Lopez said to her most recent husband, I won't keep you long. I know I've I know got a little bit long. What I'd like to do, though, is, uh, is to talk a little bit about, uh, you know, by the way, I really enjoyed uh, watching you cross-country athletes, uh, men and women, boys and girls. I enjoyed watching you all today run. Uh, it was really, what a beautiful day.
great performances. Very, very nice. What I'd like to do is, is talk a little bit. It gave me some memories of my old time running, and especially when I looked at your face, I can remember the, the pain that you feel when you're running. People don't realize how painful running is, but let me, I'd like to talk about a goal that I set for myself to uh, win a gold medal. Now, what it took to get to that point, what it was like to compete in the Olympic Games, but more importantly, along the way, to offer a few observations of how the lessons I learned in track and cross country, at least in my opinion, have served me well in life. And I hope that at least some of those at least will have meaning for you too. Is this cutting in and out? Are we okay, Chandler? As you can imagine, in order to get to the point where I was able to compete for a gold medal, I'd go through many years of practice and preparation. I'd been training about eight years, started in, in my freshman year in high school. At the time, like a lot of teenagers, I was trying a lot of different things. You know, for your self-esteem, you're trying to find something that you can be good at. So I was trying a lot of sports, basketball, baseball, believe it or not, even football. And I remembered that there was a sign up for, for track. And I thought, well, you know, it's a sport I haven't tried out. I'll, I'll give track a try. I was just breaking down my locker room from basketball. I was the 14th man on the 15th man squad. I knew I wasn't going to be a good basketball player. But, you know, I wanted to find something that I could be happily decent at. So I went to the room where they were having the organizational meeting, and I got there late, and the coach was talking to everybody. There was a door up here with a window in it. I looked through, and I saw the coach was already talking, and I was very, extremely shy in high school. In fact, uh, my wife told me a few years uh, ago that if I wasn't so shy, our son Scott would be two years older. <laughs> <laughs> I started walking down the hall, and uh, and I thought to myself, you know, Dave, you'll never know if you can in track if you don't if you don't try. So I went back to the room. Luckily, the coach was standing there. He opened the door. Uh, I walked in. Everybody laughed at me. Oh, it's just waddle. I can remember my shoulders slumped and my eyes hit the floor. And I kind of walked to the back of the room and sat down. But as I reflect on that now. Uh, those extra steps that I took back to that door, the beginning of a journey that allowed me to travel all over the world, to dream of someday competing in the Olympic Games, and eventually to stand on the top step of an Olympic platform. Well, during my uh, high school years, I was only running about uh, 10 to 15 miles a week. And you can't imagine that, can you? They're running 70, 80 miles now. I was running 10 to 15 miles a week in high school. But upon graduation from high school and enrollment at Bowling Green, uh, but the mileage and the intensity of my workouts increased rather significantly. By the time the Olympic trials rolled around in 72, I was running probably about what Ben's running now, 70 to 120 miles a week, uh, two times a day. Finding you had to run in all kinds of weather conditions, you know, if it's rain or, or, or snow outside. Also found you had to run through minor injuries and sicknesses. And you sit there, what do you mean you had to? Because the competition was. You know, if I ever missed a workout, in a week, I always felt that the guys I'd be competing against this on that weekend, they made that workout, and by making that workout, they'd have just a little edge on me. And as you saw in that Olympic race, a little edge is the difference between achieving your goals and not achieving your goals. But you know, you also find, I also found that, you know, when you get to the Olympic Games, uh, everybody's been working hard. Uh, a lot of times you find out they have a very similar training system as you do. And they too have as their own goal. They want to win a gold medal. They step on the track, they want to win a gold medal. So what other attributes are important in developing what I call a winning attitude? I just want to touch on three. Concentration, confidence, and competitive spirit. Concentration, mental focus, uh, being able to concentrate on a specific desired task and keep focusing on that until it's accomplished. I can remember coming down that home stretch of that Olympic race, and my mind was acting like a little computer. Every step that I was taking was, how far is there to the finish line? How far was the leader ahead of me? And how much was I gaining on him on each step? So it was a recalculation. But the interesting thing was there were 80,000 screaming fans. I could hear them in the video. Uh, I never heard one of them, never saw one of them. It was total focus on the finish line and getting that uh, gold medal and getting to that finish line. <laughs> also found there's uh, a lot of different ways of getting yourself uh, mentally prepared. The one that I used a lot was visualization. You know, a lot of people wonder, you know, what do these crazy distance runners think about when they're out there running 15, 20 miles? What's going through your mind? Well, when I take those long runs by myself, I'd be visualizing myself in races against some of the best 
competitors in the world. So I'd have people you know, behind me. Sometimes I'd be ahead in the race. But the interesting thing about the visualization is I always pictured myself with always pictured myself being successful. So no matter where I was in the race, I always pictured myself getting that finish line first. Where I found that was helpful in a race like the Olympic Games when I was so far behind for that first 200 meters, in my mind's eye, I had already been in that situation and had overcome it. And it gave me just a kernel of confidence that I could do it, do it again, very important. And then the other thing, the other uh, technique I would use is, I always believe there was uh, tremendous power in, in prayer. I started praying before competitions my junior year in high school. I always felt that it really kind of gave me a, an inner confidence and an outward strength to do my best. But where I, I found my prayer life that helped me the most was in my, in my defeats. You know, I, I won some races. I lost a lot of races, too. And where my prayer life helped me was picking myself up after a defeat and you know the old proverbial dust yourself off, but to refocus then and to move forward uh, in your in your uh, your career. Another attribute I think is important is confidence. Confidence in your coach or mentor. Confidence in uh, your uh, training system, operations, coursework. But most importantly, confidence in yourself. I can remember how depressed I was before the Olympic Games. I'd come down with an injury. Uh, developed tendonitis in my left knee. My mileage was cut from about 75 miles a week to where I was only, wasn't able to run at all five and six weeks before the Olympics. I was only able to build it up to about uh, 15 to 20 miles. So back to that thing I was thinking about the competitors. You know, they all made the workouts. They're going to be in tip-top shape, and I'm going to be out of shape. And uh, so I was really down in that. And I could remember my coach at uh, Bowling Green, Mel Broke, he sat me down on a grassy knoll outside the Olympic Village. I can still see it. And he said, hey, don't worry about it. All the mileage you've been doing, all the base work you've been building up for over the last year, it's going to carry you through the Olympics. You're going to be just fine. You know, as trite as it sounds, I had enough confidence in him and in the training system that he had put me through that when I stepped on the track, even though it didn't look like it at the beginning of that race, but before the gun went off, I honestly believed I could win. Uh, that uh, that gold medal. Confidence is a tremendous attitude to have. You don't have to be boastful. You don't have to tell other people how good you are. You simply have to believe it in your heart. And I think people develop a winning attitude by achieving a lot of little victories along the way. And I've always been a management by objective. I know goal orientation, is, goal setting is, is where it's, it's in vogue now. I've always been a management by objective type person. Yeah. I look at objectives as kind of bite-sized goals, but I also look at them as confidence builders. If objectives are set right, they have to be achievable. Every time you achieve one of these personal objectives, that minor victory becomes motivating, moves you towards your next objective, which moves you towards your overall goal. Winning begins winning begins winning. And if something happens to disrupt your plan of action, like an athlete gets a pulled muscle, or you face a personal crisis, economic downturn, you don't do well in a particular course, Winners keep going, they persevere. You gotta keep your eyes on the prize and keep moving. I think that's probably the biggest difference between those who achieve their goals and those who don't. Winners don't give up in the face of adversity. They keep moving even if they have to slow the pace. We all get the wind knocked out of ourselves. Every one of us will have it. But I've found the people that achieve their goals are the ones that keep inching towards that goal even if it's at a slower pace. Last attitude I wanna talk about a lot of ways I think it's most important is you have to have a competitive spirit. I think a successful athlete, a successful person, has to have the desire to do his or her best. The Olympic creed says the most important thing in the games is not to win but to take part. Well, I don't think winning should be all important. I think the desire to do your best and belief that you will do your best is. I always like the way Michelangelo said, Lord, grant that I may always desire more than I can attain. You know, uh, a lot's happened to me. Or in, at least in that race itself, uh, you know, I tell people I was in the park behind in that first lap. I thought I was winning the race. I mean, you know, <laughs> race. Arch is saying, you were really out of that race. I was going, yeah, I really was out of that race. But I can remember that first 100 meters that uh, I almost never did. I remember looking up in the stands and just thinking, you know, Dave, this is embarrassing. You're going to go home. And all your teammates are going to, your friends are going to come up to you and say, you know, you could have at least been in the race. So all I was trying to do was just catch up. 
and uh, I was able to regain contact after that first uh, 400 meters. Uh, I was able to relax for about 100 meters and arch off the heavy favorite surges to the lead. I just kind of made a semi move to the outside to stay out of trouble. I started my kick, that's my all out, with about 180 meters, kind of going into that last turn. But at the top of the stretch, that computer's rolling around in my mind. I'm not gaining at all at the other runners. So at the top of the stretch, I thought, you know, I'm just going to go after the bronze medal. I think I could only get third because I, I just wasn't gaining on them. And about halfway down the home stretch, I passed the first Kenyan. And like any good manager, I quickly reevaluated the goals. I'm going to have the silver medal now. And it wasn't until about 10 meters before the finish line when I actually thought I had a shot. And uh, uh, with that final surge and lean at the tape, uh, the Lord enabled me to, to win. You know, I, I, I don't get asked very much anymore. It's been 40 years after the Olympics, but you know, sometimes you're asking, you know, what's it feel like to win a, a gold medal? And it's always been kind of a tough question for me to get my hands around. But I'm not afraid to say that, uh, or ashamed to say that I got a tear in my eye when you hear the strains of the national anthem and you see the American flag being raised up to the highest height. You know, as I, I always thought as a, history, I was a history major at Bowling Green, I've always wondered what some of our founding fathers must have felt when they accomplished so much for our country. And there for just a fleeting moment on the victory stand, I felt a small measure of what it must have felt. You know, as, whereas I, I knew I was running for Dave Waddle, I also knew I was representing the United States. And a dream I had as a teenager in Camden, Ohio, had become a reality. And I was very proud, still I'm proud to be a citizen of a country where dreams can come true. Well, what's happened to me uh, since uh, beauty, I packed uh, four years of a college education into five years. My parents were always said when I got out. Um, I ran a couple years of professional track uh, and then established myself in the admissions uh, at, at, uh, at Rhodes for the last 29 years and now just in an interim position in Millsaps. But you know, the Olympic experience remains very vivid in my mind. And I think I'll always remember what a little hard work, a focused mind, self-confidence and can accomplish. Um, I'd like to end with a verse of scripture that I'd like to apply to myself as, a, as an athlete, as a person. The Apostle Paul says, in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets first prize. So run your race to win. You know, I want to thank you all for having me here. For the students, so you, uh, you've been given a tremendous opportunity to attend Asheville. Each one of you have tremendous potential for the future. My hope is that when you leave Asheville, you'll have the commitment and the desire and the motivation to make your mark on the world. So I wish uh, all of you Godspeed as you pursue uh, your dream.